Hello and welcome to Don't Shout at the Telly with me, your host, Saleha Ali. We're delighted to have with us today Brendan O'Neill, who is the editor of online magazine Spiked. And Brendan will be talking to us today about new atheism and what's wrong with it. Brendan, would you like to start us off? Yes. I find myself in a very peculiar position these days of being an atheist, but finding myself constantly wound up by other people who call themselves atheists, particularly by what people refer to as new atheists, or what I prefer to call activist atheists, people who make a virtue out of the fact that they are atheists, a virtue out of the fact that they simply don't believe in God. And you see these people all the time. You see them on TV, you see them in newspaper articles, they write books, their books sell millions and millions of copies and get to the top of the book charts. People like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens before he died, people of that ilk who are extremely popular, have lots of followers and are famous simply for not believing in God, mostly. And the reason I find these people irritating, there's a number of reasons. Firstly, they, are, they tend to be very smug, annoying, quite rude people. So they are rude about the religious. They think religious people are stupid. They think if you believe in God, you must have some kind of brain deficit. You're an idiot. You haven't thought about the world properly. They're arrogant. They think they know the answers to everything just because they've studied science or because they've kind of pushed the Bible to one side and focused instead on being rational and reasoned. They're very self-satisfied. They believe that they know uh, the truth about everything and that the rest of us don't. But there are two things in particular about New Atheism that really wind me up. The first thing is the very fact that you have this group of people who define themselves by what they're not, who define themselves through what they don't believe in rather than what they do believe in. So they define themselves by the fact that they don't believe in God, which is not really a good thing to define yourself through, because that's simply the absence of something. That's a negative. That's the lack of something. And I think if you're going to go onto the public stage, make a spectacle of yourself, declare your opinions, then it should be along the lines of what you do believe in. It should be a positive. It should be something that you uh, have thought about and you've attached yourself to and that you take seriously. It shouldn't be something that you reject and you think is stupid. And then the second thing that really winds me up about these atheists is the way in which they reduce mankind effectively to a monkey, really. Because what they do is they they don't accept the supernatural explanation for humanity that religion offers. And so they think you have to counter it with a naturalistic explanation. They say the supernatural explanation is wrong. Uh, it's not true that God created us in six days and created the whole world and made us what we are and you made Adam and Eve and everything else. So they say the supernatural stuff is rubbish. We have to have a natural explanation. So they say we are just bundles of DNA. We're just bundles of genes. We are effectively just quite well-evolved monkeys. We're biological entities, that's all there is to us. And they talk about neuroscience and biology and all these other scientific categories to define what humans really are. So they see themselves as demystifying human beings, but what they do in the process is they really rubbish humanity and treat us as just another animal. So what I would say, as an atheist myself, I would say I also don't accept the supernatural explanation for humanity, that the idea that God created us, I don't believe that's true. But I also think that the naturalistic explanation is not enough. It's not enough to say that human beings are just animals, just clever animals. I think there is something special about humanity, something that's actually really hard to define and really hard to pin down scientifically. So that, I think, is the real dividing line between what I would consider a proper, positive, atheistic starting point to humanism, which is the idea that we have to explain why human beings are so special, and new atheism, which just thinks human beings aren't special, that we're just animals. So those are the reasons why I find myself mortified whenever I hear fellow atheists on TV or read their newspaper columns. It's because they're smug, they're rude, they're annoying, and they define themselves through a negative, and they hate human beings. I just wonder why you uh, think this is happening now, because if you think about the influence of uh, religion for a really large part of human history, it's really quite influential. And now, some of the things the new Pope is coming out with, you kind of think, well, he's not really Catholic. The Anglican Communion is uh, at war with itself. Islam has got a, a terrible PR problem. 
So you do think, well, it's a, it's a bit of an odd time for, for people to be choosing this battle. It sort of extends the definition that we have of what a true atheist is from being somebody who simply doesn't believe in God to going all the way to somebody who believes that nobody should believe in God. And I think that's what a lot of atheists stand for in this day and age, which is why I'm of the opinion that there is no single person who can stand on this earth and say, I am an atheist in the truest form, because every atheist that I've met seems to have a further agenda. Do you think that they, the new atheists seem to have that same kind of evangelical zeal for trying to convert people, and they always kind of like focus on extremes and of what people believe and present that as if it's the normal. So they're constantly seem to be going on about creationism and creationists. And, you know, I went to a religious school, I know a lot of people that are, you know, quite devout Christians, and I've only met one or two people in my entire life who are probably creationists, it's like a very fringe, uh, fringe belief, and yet, if you listen to, well, not just Dawkins, but even, <coughs> you see people like Ricky Gervais or Stephen Fry, these comedians, and they think they're popping some big orthodoxy by having a go of creationists, when they're just this kind of really small kind of fringe group that people think are quite daft anyway and yet they think they're doing something really important by attacking them. I think that's what's fundamentally wrong with new atheism is that it's never able to go beyond being against religion. It never gets off of that subject and so it can't ev ever propose any sort of social change. If you believe in something, right, what's wrong with, you know, wanting to convince other people of your point of view? So I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with thinking other people should you know, believe what I believe because I think I, I think what I believe is right. I was going to say to you, Brendan, that Spiked is a political magazine. It's often very critical of many things. And I guess uh, sometimes people might accuse you of some of the things that you're accusing new atheism of, you know, sneering attitude. I mean, I don't think this, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's actually okay and quite important to be critical and be able to criticise many things, even if it is religion or religious practices or, or God or whatever. Um, but what would you say is the difference between new atheism and, for example, you? Spikedism. Well, the, the spite is driven by a political outlook, which is humanism, or radical humanism as I prefer, which is that we have faith in humankind, not blind faith, but historical faith as demonstrated by all the amazing things that humankind has done over the past few thousand years. So we are driven by a positive. And so when we criticise people, which we do all the time, it's because we think they counter humanism. They are going against humanism. We think they are misanthropic or they are downbeat or they are anti-human in some way. So our criticism is driven by a kind of overarching picture, I would argue. People may well disagree with that, but that's what, what I think. The difference with atheism is that it's just driven by... Uh, not believing in something. It doesn't have that kind of core belief that drives it forward. All it has is that core um, disdain for religion and for people who believe in God. So it's driven very negatively to attack people who believe what it doesn't believe. So my problem is, um, I don't have a problem with people who are atheists, but I just think being an atheist is really boring. It's just, all it does is describe something you don't, you don't believe in God. Well done, congratulations. You know, lots of people don't believe in God. It's, that's no big deal. On the question of what, why today, why has it come around today when religion is kind of in crisis? I think that's a really interesting question because I think the new atheism actually springs from a crisis of humanism. It's very hard to be a humanist today because we're surrounded by political ideas that tell us human beings are crap environmentalism, which tells us human beings are destructive. All they do is leave a massive footprint on the planet and kill everyone. Politicians are always telling us that hu human beings are abusive and, and they, they uh, have abusive relationships and they abuse children and they're perverts. That's what we hear from politicians. Popular culture tells us that human beings are, uh, have really destructive relationships and men beat women and men get drunk and, you know, we're all racist. There's these constant messages from culture from politics from campaigners which says human beings are really rotten people that's what we're told that's what the message that seeps through so it is hard to be a humanist it's hard to stand up and say actually that's wrong it's not true human beings are capable of amazing things so we're having a crisis of humanism and i think the new atheists feel incapable of saying that humans are good and so what they and, and they feel incapable of, belie of believing in anything strongly particularly believing in humanity strongly so they have this knee-jerk instinct to attack anyone who does believe in things, who does believe in the greater good of humanity or the kindness of humanity or the ability of human beings to help each other. And one group of people who believe in that idea very strongly today are religious people. 
and Christians and Muslims and other people who still have a slightly strange, but nonetheless still have a faith in the idea that people are generally capable of being good. So you have this really weird situation today where religious people are more humanistic than the so-called humanists. That's the very strange position we find ourselves in today. I often find myself having a lot more in common with a Catholic priest than I do with uh, an, a radical atheist. Because sitting here as a Christian, I was thinking that somebody that's coming here as an atheist and doesn't actually believe in God, what am I going to have in common with, with you in that belief mm. strain? And yet I'm listening to you and thinking, but he does believe in what I believe in, which is that humanity can be good. And I mean, a lot of the things that the atheists are enjoying today, even the newer atheists, have been brought about by the Christians or by not just Christians, but anybody that has a higher belief. As an atheist, I can still be critical of new atheism and still have some criticisms of, of religion as well. I think the problem is there's limit, limits to what religion is able to, you know, people can do and how they can perceive themselves. Mm -hmm within religion because there's always going to be a high, there's a higher being of God. Brendan's point that the atheist identity is, uh, is defined almost by a relationship with what it is not. I'm not sure that, that this is the basis for a, for a critique on atheism. I, I, for me, all religious identities are kind of exist in this dialectic relationship between some notion of us and other. Christianity is this reaction to Judaism. Whatever a Protestant is, it definitely, they, they definitely, whatever their identity is, it is definitely not Catholic. An atheist is not someone that does not believe in nothing. It's someone that believes that there is no God. But I'm not sure why that belief is somehow less of less value than someone that does believe in a God. It's not enough to say that I believe there's no God. It's like me standing up as a Muslim and saying I believe there is a God, and then not giving anything further on what my beliefs are. Mm on the basis of that, you know, central judgment. So atheists stand up and say there is no God. What else do they believe? That there should be no faith, there should be no religion, there should be... I, I don't know. And I'd love to challenge yeah. an atheist to give me the answers to that. Well, I think we'd be here all day if we were trying to discuss um, these questions. For me, the uh, important aspect of it is that, you know, in a society, it's how we manage different religious beliefs, when people have different attitudes towards how society should be governed. How do we find a mechanism to enable people to believe in their own you know, religion. For a long time that was the idea of a secular society. And there were different forms of secularism, but there's a kind of sort of belief that ultimately you know, the state has a is religious neutral, isn't necessarily atheist, but you have to kind of separate yourself off from your religious identity and you come together in a, hopefully a democratic society and debate these things out. What seems to me the heart of this new atheist discussion today is there's no longer a faith in a secular society who's going to have to manage these things. still don't quite understand myself how the, the secular project seems to be in crisis today. I want to touch on, the, on, the, on Brendan's point on the lack of faith in humanity. I think that's crucial to talk about this because, for example, a recent study that showed, well, it analysed the correlation between intelligence and religious people and it concluded that religious people were less intelligent than atheists. I find that very problematic because instrumentalizing science to kind of condemn and undervalue uh, religious people's intelligence, I see it as almost a, as a, an attack on, on the Enlightenment's rationalism and, and reason and people's ability and you know intellectual capacity to think what they think. I think as well it's important to acknowledge that sometimes you are looking for answers in in something and they're not necessarily there. I mean, what I was wondering about earlier was building on communities and how religion actually provides community and social sort of gatherings of people with shared interests. Um, I wonder whether a humanist society or atheism, I know you were saying there, was, those are, there are differences between them two, but whether they can provide that same sort of basis for people to interact with each other and share their ideals. One of the problems as well with new atheism is that it does seem to be quite intolerant and in a society where there's clearly a multitude of beliefs, I find that intolerance worrying. Actually, I think 
as far as I understood uh, the, what the new atheists are doing, uh, actually they're not even trying to, uh, to, um, to convert anyone because uh, there is a kind of inevitability of uh, people uh, believing in God for uh, biological uh, reasons. What in particularly interested me about what um, Brandon said is uh, that uh, there is a common spring between uh, you know, uh, the new atheism from, um, you said, a crisis of humanism. Uh, where does uh, this crisis of humanism come from? It's a deep-rooted problem, the crisis of humanism. It has many roots. I don't think it's caused by any one of these ideologies. I don't think it's caused by Greens or by uh, New Atheists or by other misanthropes. It's a, it's a mixture of different phenomena in the 20th and 21st century, which is just a feeling of exhaustion of the human project. I think Dave's right that, that there's a sense that the secular project is no longer possible. And I think the reason that that's no longer seen as possible mm. is also because of the crisis of humanism. Because the thing that you need in order to have a properly working secular society is the faith in the ability of human beings to organise their affairs and to engage with each other and to have a clash of ideas. It's the lack of faith in the ability of humans to do that which also explains why lots of these new atheists aren't actually interested in creating a positive secular society. They're just interested in attacking individuals who believe certain things. I think it's, it's also right that the new atheists are increasingly intolerant. You can see this in the way in which they have a hissy fit whenever a nurse wears a crucifix to work, or when Catholic schools want to teach that traditional marriage is uh, superior to gay marriage. They go mental, they think that's terrible, these institutions shouldn't be allowed to do that. Which I find really shocking, firstly because it's an attack on freedom of religion, and secondly because these new atheists seem to be so stupid that they don't realise that the Enlightenment, which they claim to be adherents of, uh, comes from a belief in religious freedom. To have these modern day so-called enlightenment men and women saying, oh, religious freedom's a load of rubbish, take off your crucifixes, stop teaching this in your Catholic schools, stop doing that, is really a testament to how little this has in common with the enlightenment itself or with the birth of modern day democracy and humanism. But I think just going back to the question of what religion and humanism have or had in common, the way I see it is that what they used to have in common in, in, in the past few hundred years, which they've now lost, is a belief that humans can exercise free will. Now the difference, of course, is that religions thought that our free will was kind of hampered by the existence of this higher being, by this creature who would judge us if we made the wrong decision with our free will, or who was ultimately in control of our destinies. Whereas humanists said, yes, you can exercise your free will and you have to take responsibility for it. You are in control of what happens to you. So they had a lot in common. The thing that separated them was the question of where this free will comes from. I think previously atheism might have been quite emancipatory and sort of, um, if you look at people like Feuerbach and things like that, sort of saying that let's give back human beings these sort of um, properties that have been alienated from them and things like that. But kind of when did it stop being that project? When did that kind of, like when did it all go wrong? There are still some important secular battles to be winning. Are there still battles that atheists should be taken up, do you think? I mean, you know, we still have bishops in the House of Lords. But today I'm not sure that those things are really necessary. You know, you sometimes hear New Atheists say, no, it's terrible that bishops are in the House of Lords and it's terrible that religious people are constantly whispering in the ears of politicians. I think that's a, that's a minority thing these days. I think it's terrible that the House of Lords exists at all. And, you know, the fact that it's full of loads of idiots, including, you know, just friends of politicians or trendy people who, who did some wonderful work with a charity, I don't see what right they have to determine what laws we pass, any more than a bishop. So I don't think religion has a massive influence on society. And what I'm concerned about now is that the attacks on any public expression of religion, particularly on faith schools, has now crossed the line to being just very intolerant. Surely it's right for people who are interested in the way society is organised to be intolerant of certain uh, religious practices, the way some people who uh, believe in Islam uh, treat women. Surely it's right to be intolerant of uh, forced marriages. Some people, for instance, uh, get very worked up about circumcision. Uh, but, you know, there are, there are things that we, you know, we should be intolerant of, surely. There is still campaigns against abortion provision, uh, you know, the morning after pill. You know, there are real impacts that religious uh, you know, belief does have and people aren't as equally comfortable being challenged on that either. There is increasing that sort of sense of you can't say that when I've been offended because when somebody's criticising my religious belief, it's not just a matter of, oh, you disagree with me, let's try and find out a common ground. It's, a, you know, you have offended my 
life, my sense of being, um, and I can't tolerate that. In France, where they have like banned the niqab and they've, um, you know, uh, religious, overtly religious symbols in schools or the civil service and things like that have been gotten rid of altogether, and that doesn't really seem to have happened yet. So can we expect that kind of thing to happen soon here? I'm not sure that new atheism is a massive problem, to be honest, like at least in Britain. For example, conversations that I have where I want to be critical of uh, the face veil, for example. I always uh, get treated with, oh, but that's very offensive, you know, uh, you, you can't say that about someone else's belief. And it's like, well, I can. I do think it's quite, you know, degrading and a, a strange way to, to exist in public life. From what I can see, the bigger problem, maybe, is a kind of cultural relativism and more identity politics, which new atheism is also very much part of. But if you look at the way in which, for example, lots more of public policy is now determined through scientific evidence, right? That's presented as a victory for secularism, or a victory for rationalism at least. Whereas I think it's actually quite anti-democratic, the way in which all these scientific experts have been brought into these kind of um, committees to determine which drugs should be available and which drugs shouldn't be available, and what kind of education children should have and what kind of education they shouldn't have. So I'm less worried about religious figures in being involved in the House of Lords than I am by all these kind of scientific experts. And I think that's part of this same kind of pseudo-rationalism phenomenon. If you look at the discussion about faith schools, I think there are some encroachments on faith schools' free religious freedoms. You know, faith school can only now take on a certain number of people of that faith, and it has to take on 25% or 35% or something of people of other faiths. And that really waters down what these schools are capable of teaching. And, and the right of people, the, the right of private association, the right of parents to send their children to associations in which they uh, only mix with children of the same faith, that's a right, I think, parents ought to have in a free democratic society. So there are various ways in which the pseudo-rationalist agenda is impacting on politics and on social life. The question Jason raised about intolerance of certain faiths and traditions and beliefs that are backward, I agree with you that lots of those things are backward. Uh, you know, I think the face veil is backward and whenever I see a woman wearing it I get really angry and I feel sometimes like ripping it off. Obviously I don't because that would be an assault and that's a bad thing to do. Is that even if she chooses to wear it? Yeah, even if she chooses to wear it because why? I just think, it, why on earth would you want to cover your face and be so astonishingly antisocial? Now I recognise that Muslim women are not the only people who do this. You, you see it amongst young so-called chavs who wear the caps over their eyes and sunglasses or you know there's lots of people or hoodies there are a lot of people these days who are who express their disdain for society through fashion what i was going to say in relation to what jason said is i don't think the right term for me not liking that is intolerance because if i was intolerant of it i would probably campaign for it to be banned and that i wouldn't do because i think people should have the right to express themselves in these ways but then the rest of us should have the right to ridicule them and to criticise them. I think this comes back to the point about uh, relativism, which is a problem in society. Everyone must have the right to criticise religion and to criticise religious people. But that, to me, is not intolerance. That is uh, free speech. That is an expression of critical, free-minded freedom of speech, which is very important. So uh, intolerance, for me, means a a an attempt to squish those things, to stop them from happening, to stop them from being expressed. But we should be a bit more critically minded about the idea that religion is the biggest problem in our society. It's not. It's not the, the biggest problem that we face. And that's the balance I think we need to strike. I think that it is actually intolerant to, um, to even though you feel personally you don't like to see a woman in a face veil, it's quite ignorant to assume that they're being antisocial. And to put these two types of people, a guy with a hood like drawn <coughs> over his face and a woman in a face veil, they dress like that for very different kinds of reasons. If you look at the women in Britain who wear the face veil, there are, there, are, there are lots of kinds, but there are two general kinds. There are those who are immigrants here and who come from a tradition in which the face veil is worn. And I, I understand that. I, I still think they should stop doing it. But I understand that. But then there are younger British-born women whose mothers didn't wear the veil or whose grandmothers didn't wear the veil, but who then wear it themselves. And you see them in shops. Whenever I go into Selfridges, for some reason, there are always these young British-born women in face veils, some with the whole veil, walking around, looking at lipstick, thinking about what shoes they're going to buy. And this is, I think this is another form of youthful, antisocial fashion. And it's, it, it, I think it's very similar to hoodies, or being a goth, or being a punk, in the sense this that it's an adoption of a form of dress 
as a way of expressing your kind of detachment from society. This it's an is imposing those, those ideas upon them. I've had various conversations with women who like to wear face veils, and they describe reasons that are very different from the ones you've given. And I think that if we're going to criticise religion, and I agree that we definitely should have a right to, it shouldn't be protected, but we really need to be very careful about how we do so. We need to take the time and effort to understand the perspective of someone who is religious and says that they you know, act in a certain way for that kind of reason. For me, it seems more a nice sense of belonging if, if someone uh, chooses to adopt something that perhaps their, their parents did not, but is from their, um, their religious background further down. I mean, when, every St. Patrick's Day, I'm, I'm an eighth Irish, and it's not, it's not a big thing <laughs> in my life, but I, you know, I, get slaughtered, I get slapped on St. Patrick's Day, I wear the, the green hat and everything, and it's just a way of belonging to this imagined but community. Wearing a green hat once a year is very different from wearing a black cloak every day of the year. These are different things, and I think the way I see it is the face veil actually captures the problem that we face today, the, the, the dual problem of relativism on one side, and new atheist hysteria on the other. Because on the one side you have the relativists who say, oh, you can't criticise these women who cover their faces because that's really judgmental and bad and intolerant. Whereas like, it isn't. It's just a free-minded critical judgment of a form of behaviour that I think is unsuitable for a democratic society. But then on the other side, uh, alongside the relativists, you have the new atheists who think that these women in veils signal the end of civilization and are destroying British values, single-handedly destroying British values. And, you know, we have to keep them out or we have to take their veils off and that will make Britain a better place. And I think that's the experience that they've had in France. I think the reason France has banned the face veil is because they think that's a great way of defending the French Republic, which is in a dire state and all their values are no longer treated seriously and it's kind of corroding from within. Both of those arguments are wrong. I think you should be free to criticise these people and you should be free to say that their actions are backward and stupid. But I think it's wrong to say that they are responsible for the decline of Enlightenment thinking or the decline of liberal humanism or the decline of democratic thought. Those, those things are corroding from within society, not at the hands of women who come from abroad with strange practices. And this idea that we can't you know, have an argument from people that wear a veil is almost like undermining their capacity to defend themselves and say, you know, I'll wear the veil for these reasons. So, you know, you're also trying to say that they're not capable of doing that if we can't challenge them on the fact that they wear a veil. This issue cuts to the question of um, the difference between criticism and intolerance. And I think that's a really important issue to, to get to grips with because you have to be free in a society, I think, to, you have to be free to blaspheme, to write poems about Jesus being a homosexual, to make the most outrageous film showing Muhammad to be a paedophile, whatever. I think freedom, if you are serious about freedom of speech, then you have to have the freedom to do all those things. I would like to go back to uh, Brendan's um, introduction when you said that uh, we're not just uh, apes, descendants from apes, but there is uh, something great about human mm. beings, something unexplainable by science, probably, so far. What I would like to ask you is, uh, what is the, this greatness about? about? Is it just about uh, consciousness or uh, um, our ability to create things and to change our destiny? I wouldn't say just consciousness. I think it is consciousness, it is, which is, is, is not just a, a small thing. It's a very important thing. It's, the, it's our self-awareness, awareness of who we are, what we are, and of our impact on our surroundings. But I think it is really hard to define. The philosopher Raymond Tallis, I interviewed him recently, and he said, if human beings were so simple that they could be understood in scientific terms, then we would be too simple to understand ourselves. Um, so there is something mysterious about human beings. There is something that we qu you can't plot on a graph or in a pie chart or in a scientific journal. And I don't mean mis mysterious as in godly or uh, otherworldly or bestowed on us by some higher being. I just mean something that is extraordinary and different from every, every other living creature. And I think it is consciousness. And I think it is consciousness comes both from the fact that we have a brain, but also that we have relationships with other people. That is the thing that makes us human beings. And so I really dislike the way in which new atheists and other pseudo-rationalists try and reduce human beings to that level of just kind of monkeys, uh, collections of DNA who do various things because they're programmed to do it. That is a 
deeply anti-humanist argument, and in fact it's far worse an argument than any argument that was ever put forward by Christians or the Vatican or any other uh, religious faith. It's far more regressive than anything that's come from religion. I sort of feel as though there's not really a space um, for anything beyond kind of economics and science, so we have to explain everything in terms of science, and everything political has to sort of give us economic growth and stuff, so there's no kind of you know, we don't have socialism anymore and things like that, so there's no... We're not going anywhere, so we've given up on the idea of progress and stuff, so this kind of... It just seems like we're just sort of fighting each other over nothing, really. I mean, it seems really dull to just keep going, well, there is there is a God. No, there isn't a God. It just sort of seems really boring. There will be a point where you won't be able to account for things that are happening in the world, or what's going to happen tomorrow, what are we doing here? All these questions still remain unanswered when you when you say, I don't believe in God. And at some point, you put your faith in something else. Like Brendan said, he puts his faith in people as a humanist. So that's why I think this idea of atheism is very hollow, and it's sort of akin to the child in the playground who sits with their arms folded and says, I'm not playing. It's somebody who just stands up and says, I'm not going to answer any of these questions. I don't believe in anything. But it doesn't make the questions go away just to deny that, you know, that there is a God. Religion, which offers you transcendence, is superior to lots of these modern misanthropic movements, in my view. But I think you're right that God is, is the thing that stands in the place of things we can't explain. I mean, that was always the humanist understanding of religion, that religion existed because humanity was incapable of explaining his own greatness. And because it was incapable of explaining its own greatness, the fact that it was so obviously superior to every other creature, the fact that it was clever, the fact that it wasn't an ape, it, t it created these stories that could try to explain it. It created a God. It created all these ideas, all these stories. And, you know, as Marx said, religion is the sun that revolves around man so long as he doesn't revolve around himself. That's what religion was. Religion was our own explanation for our greatness, which we couldn't find a way of explaining in human terms. What I think, what is different today is that new atheists, religious people, environmentalists, none of them believe in the greatness of human beings anymore. They don't. So I think that the, the humanist project today has to be to try to find a, a real, rational, reasoned way of explaining and convincing people of the greatness of human beings and making a situation where man does revolve around himself and is conscious of himself and goes out into the world and makes it a better place. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Thank you, Brendan, for a very uh, riveting discussion. If you want to get involved in Don't Shout at the Telly, email us. Cheers. 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 Cheers.